purpose. In this quest, may we greet one another with open hearts and minds. May we inspire each other to consider new questions and seek deeper meanings. May we cultivate wisdom and compassion. Let all who enter the sanctuary see a welcome face hear a kind word and find comfort in this community. And may all that is done and said here today be in service of love and justice. Amen. And that prayer was by Kathy Huff. And now will you rise and body our spirit for our hymn number four, I, bought my spirit, I brought my spirit to the sea. called At One, and it's by Victoria Safford. Imagine this. On the days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, every fall, every year, the people make their peace with anyone they have wronged or slighted or injured or in any way neglected over the past 12 months. The task is not to patch things up, smooth things over, reach a compromise, or sweep mistakes and uneasy memories under the rug. The task is not to feel better. The task is ownership. The goal is truth for its own redemptive sake. I did this. I said this to you, and it was wrong. I neglected this. I botched this. I betrayed you thusly. I demeaned you, whether you even ever knew it or not. This is the truth in which both of us are living. I ask you to forgive me. Imagine how many deep breaths you would need to take. Imagine how many doors you'd have to knock on, how many phone calls you'd have to make, how many letters, how many lunches and coffees, how many awkward moments with your children and your parents and with strangers, that cashier to whom you spoke so sharply. Awkward is irrelevant. The task is not about comfort. It is about truth and about wholeness and holiness, restoration. Imagine this. Someone has been preparing all year to speak with you, to write to you, to ask a hard question, 
perhaps in some way not quite conscious, you have even known this and have been preparing to. Finally, you answer the door or the phone or open the letter with shaky hands and there it is, what you thought you'd been longing for but really have dreaded. Someone is asking your forgiveness. The task is not about comfort, it is about truth. Awkward is irrelevant. You get to choose now, you have to choose, whether and how you will participate in restoration. Abandon the pleasant piety that claims knee-jerk forgiveness as the unquestioned moral course. You get to choose which way will be right in this case, between you as persons and with all your gods. What response will make the world more whole? Imagine, something yearns in us to come round right. Something creaky, rusty, heavy, almost calcified within us tries, in spite of us and all of our fears and self-deceptions, to turn and turn and creak and turn again and come round a little truer. Something in us stretches towards conversion. Imagine healing wholly from within. And now, here's the Reverend Rachel Hayes of the Unitarian Universalist Society of Amherst with our homily. I would like to begin this time together with an embodied meditation. I invite you back to your breath and the feeling of your body. The breath inside you, the air around you, the bones and muscles holding you up. The force of gravity hugging you into the earth and the structures upon it, the floor, the chair, your own beautiful consciousness playing in this moment. Breathe in, breathe out. Grow long, grow deep, be strong, be here. Blessed be. The year I lived in DC, I took a bunch of theater classes. I worked at the theater so I could take classes in their conservatory for half price, which was a really good deal. I signed up for principles of realism and braced myself for doing scene work in the 20th century, two people having a life-changing conversation style. Not my favorite. I had my prejudices and did not connect with what I assumed I would be learning. You see, I was all about the work of poetic theater playwrights like Mac Wellman and setting free the imagination to ask big questions on a tiny budget rather than trying to breathe life into a photograph or so I prejudged. The funny thing about this realism and its principles we were supposed to learn was that we had to set free our imaginations to get there with no budget at all. One of the first assignments for that class was to do an animal improvisation. We had to observe an animal until we could portray it in the conservatory classroom. For some reason, I decided I was going to be an octopus. 
I'd only ever seen an octopus once, but it seemed like a thing I needed to do. Luckily for me, there was an octopus in the National Zoo. So that weekend, I went to the zoo and stood in front of that big tank in the invertebrate house, stood there and watched the octopus all noodled up into the upper corner of the tank. It wasn't doing much. So other people did not stop for long. They mostly paused for a moment before heading on to the crabs or, or the other residents on exhibit. It felt like being in a train station and not taking a train, just standing and watching as everyone moves around you. I laid my bag and coat on the floor and decided that I could try to copy the octopus not moving if it wasn't going to move while I was there. It swayed a little bit as it took in water through its gills and propelled it out through its funnel. So I started to play with the idea of being not so much air and bones, but muscle and water. That the water I was in and the water that was in me were the same. That my body was sensing the water all over me and through me. There I was, oh so subtly rocking in place and trying to feel instead of my internal breeze of breath, an internal tide constantly waving in and out. The octopus began moving its tentacles in tiny subtle movements, tip over tip like shoelaces trying to untie themselves. So I copied that motion in my hands and wrists, delicately spiraling until the octopus's motion became larger, moving the whole arm. I moved my whole arm, trying to embody that fluidity of motion. I don't know when the octopus saw me mirroring its motion, probably pretty early on because they do have excellent eyesight, you know, but it started copying me back. I had done mirroring exercises many times in theater classes where two people face each other and make the same movement at the same time and it winds up looking a lot like this. But this was the first time I had done such a thing with a non-human partner. The octopus made its movements larger and larger until we were dancing back and forth across the front of the tank. I don't know how long we kept this up, whether it was five minutes or 30 long enough for me to get the feeling of the octopus in my body. My focus had narrowed to the tank in front of me. I could not tell you whether the invertebrate house was empty behind me or full of spectators. It was a silly moment. Silly, not meant disparagingly, but way down in its root as being in the same word family as soul, which is a thing I learned from my poetic playwright, Mac Wellman. Silly as opposed to proper or moralistic or respecting of an external order. Silly as coming from its own impulse. Silly in the way that this play meant everything and absorbed my whole being. My soul was invested in dancing with this octopus. And I think 
that is because the octopus was teaching me how to move from my center out. You see, an octopus, when it reaches, does not reach with the ends of its arms. The movement spirals from its center until the whole arm, or sometimes the whole octopus, gets where it needs to go. The tips don't operate separately from further up the arm. Everything comes from the center. And we forget that, don't we? While we're so busy moving through the air with our skeletons inside us, we've even created a myth that the octopus can do eight different things at once since it has these eight dexterous arms rather than the unified grace I saw at the zoo. It's almost as though the eight arms keep us from noticing the center. Everything has a center. Even the octopus. Even us. How do we connect to the center? How do we connect to the soul? Ralph Waldo Emerson, in his Divinity School address, called for first soul and second soul and evermore soul to fix what has become stale and rigid in our life together. I don't know for sure that he would endorse pretending to be an octopus in public, but I do know that he was an advocate for the embodied and wholehearted embrace of life. And the only way to come back to soul over and over again is to come back over and over again, to risk appearing foolish for the demands of heart and soul. It's time to get silly, full of soul. The word has meant childish, pious, and foolish at various points in its history. The best translation I can find for the word silly as I mean it, as I feel it, is wholehearted. It's time to be wholehearted. It's time to love something so much we let ourselves be beginners. This formula has become my personal theory of everything. When in doubt, how do we lean deeper into the relationship? When, when called to something bigger, scale up from the center. When something goes wrong, where have we lost connection to the center? What is the wholehearted way to stay engaged? It's time to love people so much that we screw up on Tuesday and keep trying on Wednesday, not for the sake of optics, but for the sake of relationship. Daring to get it wrong in learning to get it right. Learning in public and for the love of God, loving joy more than wit. It's why we have covenants and not just rules. We make explicit how to create relationships, not just how to break them. It's time to get silly, to love connection more than perception, to be fools together rather than cool to each other. It's time to be all in. It's time to ask the awkward question and listen to the answer. It's time to love one another instead of loving things about one another. It's time to be wholehearted, to jump in rather than hang back. What would happen if we tried to be wholehearted 
instead of being right or good or smart. Who would we be to one another if we dared to be all the way there without preconception? How could we be transformed by our own center? I think of how our life together might change, how we might reimagine our justice work, our idea of congregational right relations, if we dared to work from relationship rather than an imposed agenda. Just to be clear, I am not saying that we can't or shouldn't have agendas or procedures, but I am asking you to do something bigger. Agendas, procedures, bylaws, and institutions, if they are to exist, must serve our relationships rather than the other way around. How do they move from the center out, from that impulse to connect and be in a relationship that acknowledges that you are a whole and beautiful happening in the world, just like I am. Not simply my fellow committee member or my companion or my coffee hour friend. How do we create the pathways to relationships that acknowledge the heart in each other? To be fair, we are going to screw up. Eventually, we will treat one another as objects instead of the wonders of the universe that we all are. It happens. It happens every time there's a relationship worth ha having. The way back in is to come back in, to lean into the relationship, the covenant, and say, I didn't take your perspective into account, and I am sorry. And if any of you are taking notes, here is the formula. This is how I didn't honor you. I am sorry. Not, I'm sorry if you felt that way, or I'm sorry if I offended you. Nothing in the air, no if, just be sorry. And then do nothing. Honoring the relationship means not demanding a particular response, not imposing your project of how you will make amends. Return to treating them like a wonder of the universe who does get to make their own decision and gets to decide how they show up to the relationship. You don't protect your image. You open up. And while you're at it, scale down and be this generous with yourself. Scale up and live boldly into the communities that are part of your life. Scale all the way up and get into beautiful relationship with earth and sky and ocean. It's time to look like fools, to try something new, to invite the new kid to play, to be the new kid, to forget everyone is or is not watching. It's time to Reach out in curiosity, because sometimes that which is curious reaches back. And the movement spirals from the center so beautifully, moving past what is probable and predictable to what is real beyond our imaginations. 
we are called to witness and the only way to witness is from within to get real in ourselves and our relationships to get silly it's where the joy is where the heart is where the soul is and that is how we come back to center evermore.